thank you everybody for joining us this evening and um my name is christine curry and i'm the iowa outreach coordinator of the upper mississippi river initiative known as umri and we'd like to welcome everybody to our 2023 series on soil and water conservation thinking like a watershed program um, the monthly presentations are jointly hosted with our isaac walton league colleagues of the upper mississippi river initiative and our co-hosts include panora conservation chapter member chris uh, henning and des moines chapters communication director bud hartley i am not sure if um, the des moines chapter is going to be uh, joining in they sometimes do um, sometimes the technology uh, is a little bit of a problem and we're working on that so Anyway, if they are joining us, um, hello. And there'll be a few people in the room. This evening, we are um, so grateful to have uh, Neil and Hunter back with us. We call them the local heroes in Ca uh, ha Howard County. And our title for this evening is uh, Local Heroes in Howard County Revisited. They actually joined us about two years ago and shared um, how they've incorporated the highest percentage of acres under conservation practices in the state of Iowa. It's a, just amazing work. And um, this evening, they're going to be updating us on their uh, continued uh, successes. And during this past year, they started their own podcast called Beyond the Dirt, which we have uh, put in um, the the event page a link to that um, they share information on conservation from everything from fishing water quality soil health and improving um, farm landscapes with conservation um, i love to compare them um, to uh, sports fans i'm not a big sports fan but many people are and as i pointed out um, they really are like our Super Bowl material for conservation. And I just wanna thank them so much for all their efforts. And just think if all of our 99 counties were doing this kind of work, we'd have um, a whole different um, picture on the landscape as far as water quality and soil health. So thank you so much um, to both of you. Uh, Chris Henning will be um, taking questions uh, in the chat box, but we'll let Hunter and Neil uh, give us an update. They have a presentation. And if you have any questions, you know, you can put them in the chat box or wait until we're done and we'll have a discussion. So thanks again, everybody for joining us. Um, it's a gorgeous evening out. And I know it's hard sometimes to come in and get back on the computer, but I think this is going to be worth uh, your time this evening. So thanks. All right, we're getting our screen ready here. All right, All right. go ahead, Hunter. Awesome. Well, I know uh, Christine uh, kind of mentioned our podcast and just want to give you guys kind of a full disclosure. We actually have a a second screen going right next to us that's actually recording as well um, that we're hoping we can use this as a podcast episode here as well um, and so uh, when we first kind of started the podcast we wanted to do it as a informational page and and something that we can send out to local farmers local landowners um, peers other watershed coordinators and anyone else who may be interested as an informational piece and so um, obviously this is going to be just as much for for you guys as our listeners as well and so um, before we get started, we just wanted to, to kind of let you guys know that. So um, we're by no means professional podcasters. Uh, it was just more of a fun thing. So um, the PowerPoints are definitely our, our mantra and what we're better at. So I guess Neil's the one known for his pictures and uh, I'm the one known for trying to keep it short and sweet. So, um, but like Christine said, um, thanks for everyone having us on here. Uh, my name is Hunter Slifka. I'm the Turkey River Headwaters um, and Chiyak Creek Watershed Project Coordinator. Um, and so my project location um, lies completely in Howard County. It encompasses kind of the south half of, 
Uh, Cresco and then works its way kind of south and west, and we'll pull up a map of it um, as we start getting a little further in the presentation. And I'm Neil Schaefer. I'm the project coordinator for the Silver Creek Watershed Project. It's a 319 uh, Iowa DNR funded project. Uh, uh, we get our original funding from the EPA. Um, this is my project's been uh, on the books for about 13 years now. And um, we'll uh, kind of disclose a, a bit about what we've accomplished um, in the PowerPoint. But uh, just wonderful to have the opportunity once again to uh, reach your audience and to share what we're doing and hopefully inspire others um, across the across Iowa, the Midwest, and the nation um, to do the same thing that what we're doing. And um, you know, it, it just uh, it takes a few people with that uh, spark to really get things rolling. And um, uh, what 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 we're hoping to do is ignite some of those sparks tonight. So as far as the Silver Creek watershed, um, we're located in Northeast Iowa, right up near the Minnesota border. Um, the interesting thing about Howard County is we're the, the, the headwaters of three major rivers in Iowa. The Upper Iowa River begins just on the Minnesota border and runs across the northern part of uh, Howard County. And that's where the Silver Creek uh, is a 22,000 acre watershed uh, in the Upper Iowa River watershed. Hunter's Project, the Turkey River headwaters, um, is at the top end of the Turkey River. And we also on the western side of the county are um, the beginning of the Wapsie Pinnacan River. So it's it's kind of nice. We always say we're we're working to keep the water clean uh, at the top and work our way down. So uh, we're doing our best to send that water down down the river um, in its best con condition as possible. Um, to date, um, since 2013, over $9 million has been invested in my watershed. Um, and that includes both landowner contributions, the, the co cost share that we have for the different practices. Um, so, um, and what we're really proud of in, in Silver Creek is this last fall, we uh, exceeded 55%. So 55 and a half percent of the watershed a row crop was seeded to cover crops. And uh, I believe two years ago when I was on here, we were about 33%. So, um, and the year before, last, the year before, we went from 33% to about 46%. So my goal was to hit 50%. And uh, we far exceeded that. Um, and we'll discuss a little bit how we did that um, as, the, as the evening progresses. But uh, I would say that was our, that was my uh, highlight of the year was uh, getting to that amazing number. I seen Christine, you had your hand up. Did you have a, a question? No, I was clapping. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, we'll keep it as formal as there is. So if there are some questions that come in the chat, we can't see the chat, but if uh, one of you guys want to put your hands up uh, so we know and we can uh, try to hit those as we go along. So in the Silver Creek watershed, to be eligible for a, an EPA, uh, Iowa DNR 319, we have to have a, 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 a goal and a, 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 an impairment the impairment for the Silver Creek watershed was to re reduce bacteria levels. Um, we had E. coli levels that were very high. E. coli comes from wildlife, livestock, and septic, faulty septic systems. So um, being that the Silver Creek is a tributary to the Upper Iowa, which is it's one of the top nationwide um, destinations for kayaking, tubing, fishing, um, so a lot of real uh, close contact. Um, that's very important to try to get those bacteria levels down. So the Turkey River Headwaters Project, um, that's a project I'm working on. Uh, we're currently starting our third year um, of the actual implementation project. Uh, we had a couple of planning grants beforehand where we gathered all the research and the data and that sort of thing. Um, and so now we're in the, the full implementation here project. And uh, coming end of June, uh, we'll complete that third year and then right for an extension for another three years. Um, and so my watershed is about three times the size of Neil's. Uh, we wanted to include three separate Huck 12 sub watersheds so we can incorporate that whole Turkey River headwaters area in Howard County um, and try to include as much as we could. Um, this also includes, if you guys are familiar with Cresco or Howard County, um, the Vernon Springs um, impoundment and fish ladder. 
Uh, previously, there was a low head dam there um, and it took on some damage from the flood of 2008. And so uh, with some funding from the DNR, uh, they actually went and uh, kept the low head dam but in, implemented a fish ladder structure, uh, which has significantly improved the fisheries and the water quality, um, both above and below. And uh, this time of year, when you got a nice flow of water, it's just absolutely stunning to be able to see that. Um, in less than three years now, we spent nearly $5 million um, in conservation. Um, and so you got to kind of scale it to Neil's project. It's about half what he spent, um, but it's also three times the size of the watershed. And so um, just try to take that in scale, but definitely um, having two watershed projects, it gives us a great um, feel of competition and kind of um, trying to edge each other and stuff like that. So it makes it a little in-house fun um, as we go forward with our different projects and practices. Uh, our goals, when we first started the project, we wanted to kind of stay with the Iowa nutrient reduction strategy. Um, and so these basically go right along with that with your uh, reducing nitrates and phosphorus and sediments. Um, and then we also wanted to be at the very top of the watershed, um, reduce that peak discharge. And so infiltrating as much as that water as we can, slowing that water down um, as we get those large rain events um, so we can put those uh, below communities in the best foot possible uh, when that rain's coming down and the flood events are, are beginning. So I know um, a lot of you guys were on here a couple of years ago and seen what we had done, um, but since then we've definitely done a lot of really good projects. And I'll just talk on this one real quick. Um, our stream bank stabilization, uh, six years ago, we probably had three or four of these projects that had been completed in the county. Um, since then, we've had over 25 projects and over 25,000 feet um, of stream bank installed. Um, now, you definitely could uh, put a lot more in if we wanted to hit every single curve and every single um, harsh bank, um, but we would be out there 24 7 surveying and trying to get those um, projects funded. And so, when we go out to a project, obviously, there's there's a lot of not good banks, but there's a lot of really bad banks. And so we try to uh, really focus on the most severe ones and the ones that are affecting um, what are really affecting the farmer's goals or that landowner's goals. And so we do a couple different things. Um, when we are trying to stabilize these banks, we kind of have two different options. Um, if we see some really, really tall banks, like over six foot high that are completely sheer banks, um, we do what they call longitudinal peak stone. Um, which is basically using what slopes already there, putting a wind roll of rock and then backfilling behind it. Um, and so it's kind of against the different traditional stream bank stabilization where the traditional would be um, what you see in that bottom right picture, um, using a two to one or a four to one slope, putting that rock right at the water's uh, edge there. And we're only putting about rock two foot above the water line. And then from then on is just um, that coir fabric with a really good native seeding. Um, and so we're really trying to reduce the amount of rock that we're using to keep costs down um, so we can get multiple projects funded um, and make that money go a lot longer ways. Uh, another thing that we've been implementing with these projects to help with the different funding pools is implementing fish habitat structures. So like our vortex weirs, our J-hooks, uh, boulder clusters, our root wads are really popular. Um, and so incorporating these help us get more points. It also helps um, our fish habitat, amphibians, reptiles, um, and all those different kinds of things. Um, we mainly use EQIP funding. Um, there's a couple different pots. Uh, we have our EQIP riverine funding, and then we have a couple different RCPP pots. Um, one's a Turkey River based pot, and another one's a driftless area. And so that driftless area has some special funding um, that we've been able to utilize these last few years. The nice thing about what we're doing with this uh, kind of a, a revamped idea of design this looks much more natural. Um, I've, I'm sure you've seen the areas where you've got the riprap from the water's edge all the way to the top of the bank. Here, we're, we're still armoring, protecting that bank. We're putting soil over the top of some of that rock, that two foot that's above the water, and then putting native grasses along that. It might, looks much more natural, um, and we're still doing the same practice, and we're doing it for half the cost. Um, and the, the rock is the main cost in placing that rock. And we've been able to do as much armoring as possible with half the expense. I think one thing that probably has helped us with as much success as we had to get these projects funding is we go out and do all the IAE with our um, area engineer, kind of give us the go ahead. Um, we then go forth and do all the surveying ourselves, 
We do all the permitting ourselves. We do all the designs ourselves. Um, the area office still has to check our plans, um, but we're the ones that are in the stream doing all the surveys and all the legwork um, and that sort of stuff, rather than just going out, um, getting these applications and handing them off to those guys and making them do the workload. Um, we're taking it upon ourselves. Um, since they are our projects, we wanna take care of them and do as much as we can with these um, before we hand them off for, for funding. Um, like I said, with the redu reductions in bacteria, um, one of the, the main things with uh, the 319 funding that I received from the Iowa DNR is to help livestock producers. Um, we have uh, two large dairy producers in my water, well, actually three, three large dairy producers in my watershed, and um, probably a good dozen uh, beef producers. Um, we have one hog swine producer, but what what's amazing about this is you you'll talk to the to the landowners and and when we're doing these projects and you know we want to keep um, livestock in Iowa we want to do production agriculture but we want to do it in an environmental friendly way and every one of these people say if it wouldn't have been for what we're doing and helping them with this offsetting the cost there's no way that they would be able to do these um, amazing practices and uh, and in this instance. You just look at the size of this. Um, it's, uh, it's over a quarter million cubic feet of storage. Um, this individual has a dairy barn with about 350 dairy cows in it. And uh, the, the manure from that is, is stored. We have over five, uh, six months of storage. So we're not putting manure on, on frozen ground anymore. We're applying it in the spring and fall. Um, this is probably, oh, I don't even think it's maybe a quarter mile from the trout stream. So uh, originally when that landowner came to me, um, he called me on the weekend. He had a spill in his on his farm. It didn't reach the stream, but he said he couldn't sleep for the next two nights just worrying about what it, what it had, had happened. And uh, we've actually, this was the third manure pit we've put on his farm storage area for, he's got his heifers in one barn, he's got his cows in another um, young stock. But, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, like I said, if it wasn't for these programs, these farmers wouldn't be able to do this and we would still have manure and, and uh, you know, manure being applied in the winter on the frozen ground. And um, so it's, it's tremendous. And when we, we've invited the governor out to visit some of these sites and we've had um, our secretary of agriculture out to visit them. And what I always have the farmer talk to them and say, explain how, and, and they're very thankful for, for the assistance because they would not be uh, able to have dairy. I mean, dairy has really been going by the wayside. So many people have gotten out of it. Um, but at least what we're doing here is helping them do it in an environmental friendly way. Um, all this money is rotating back into the community and uh, we're cleaning our water. Um, our critical area in need of prairie establishments. So this is basically our CRP program. Um, Howard County has been very active in the CRP program for a lot of years. Um, to date, you can see there we have a little over 2,000 total CRP contracts, um, which is actually number five in the state right now. Um, and then we have a little over 25,000 total acres. So it's not a lot of acres, but it's a lot of contracts with a lot of really pristine or really um, precision based uh, practices along those riparian zones, along those creek beds, um, those grass waterways. Um, don't get me wrong, we definitely have some really um, nice habitat areas that can compass anywhere from four to 800 acres um, in some spots um, of both multi mixes of the pollinator like you see right here, um, along with some tall grasses, uh, food plots are starting to get incorporated a lot more. Um, they actually just transitioned our CP38 program um, to a new uh, seeding method where we're actually going to be splitting the seeding mix half as a tall thick grasses and half of it as a short pollinator mix. Um, and then they're also able to incorporate food plots with this. So it's not only gonna have that um, nice rearing habitat for those pheasants uh, in the springtime, but they're gonna have that overwinter cover where they're able to hide from the predators um, and have that nice warm cover in the winter time when we're getting a lot of snow and the harsh conditions and stuff like that. And then really placing those food plots in, in, in precise locations. Um, there's a lot of thought that go into these. 
And it's not just a throw of a dart and hope we're putting them in the right spot. We're really uh, calculating it out and making sure we're putting them in the right spots. And then probably one of the most important parts is we've been planning fire breaks on um, pretty much all of our CRP now, um, whether it's five acres, 10 acres, 100 acres. Uh, we've been planning fire breaks in there, um, sometimes more than necessary because um, these areas that are close to wooded areas, um, it's very easy for these woody vegetation, vegetation to start encroaching in um, and giving us some problems with the CRP. And so um, the management side of the CRP has been really important to us. And uh, we have a lot of fire departments in the, in the area that do CRP controlled burns. Um, and so it's a great fundraiser for them. It's making our habitat even more healthy than what it was previously. And it just really makes that connection with the landowner and their property um, even stronger at times. Uh, when you're talking about the management and what they need to be doing through the years. CRP is the best conservation practice uh, funding source out there. We have over 30 different types of uh, CRP, everything from windbreaks to grass waterways to wetland restorations. Um, we have upland bird buffers. We have pollinators. We have the pheasant uh, recovery, um, larger tracks. Um, it, it, we've got uh, the filter strips. Um, the CP43 um, buffer strips program, where we can put strips through a field. Um, a lot of study has been made. You could put 10% of a field in strips of prairie grasses and eliminate probably 90% of the erosion leaving that field. Um, but the buffer strips along our streams, uh, the grass waterways, I mean, give me a program that's harder to sell. It's 100% cost share now. So at the time of uh, completing a seeding or a grass waterway program, you get 90% of the cost uh, refunded to you um, in incentives. And then in the fourth year, we go back to make sure that this practice is, is, is living up to expectations and they will receive the, the remaining 10%. That was, that's something new that's been, been added on. But talk about uh, uh, a lot of tools that have been added to our toolbox. Um, so CRP is one of the first things we look at as far as when we go out to do a whole farm planning. Um, those, raw, those waterways are like the infrastructure of your, they're the highways of your farm, um, those concentrated flows of water. You fix the infrastructure of your farm, you take those wet areas out, you take out those um, areas. I was at a conference, 13% of all farmland has a negative return on investment. If we can get those areas that are not returning on the investment of inputs, put it into CRP, it's a win-win for everyone because you're, you're, uh, you're not throwing money on, on poor ground and expecting a, a return on yield when we can go back to what mother nature had intended and, and farm with that. You know, I, I like to say, I coined the phrase, farm the best and buffer the rest. Um, and it's very true. I mean, we can have both production agriculture and still do it in an environmental friendly way um, using a lot of these tools. And, and I can't say enough good things about CRP. I started 22 years ago um, with a grant from our local Pheasants Forever uh, group, gave a $10,000 grant, $10, grant to our soil and water district. They went out looking for someone to, to sell CRP and they knocked on my door. And uh, not that I was looking to have a job or anything, I was dairy farming with my family. And uh, I got started doing it and have fallen in love with it. And to this day, even um, with uh, my full, all the work I do in the watershed, CRP is still um, near and dear to my heart. Um, Hunter works on it. We have a summer intern every year that works on it. Um, so our, our soil and water district kind of take care of the CRP and let the NRCS federal staff work on the EQIP and the CSP, which we'll talk about here in a second. But uh, talk about um, a great program, CRP. And obviously it shows Howard County ranks fifth in the state. We were down in Des Moines last week talking with Alan Lang, um, who is on the national FSA uh, CRP um, a team, and then Kurt Gage, um, who's the head of the FSA NRC or FSA CRP in Iowa, and he he said something. You know, if you're number five in Iowa, you're probably number in the top ten in the nation because Iowa has so much CRP number of a con contract. And I never thought of it that way. I mean, here what we're doing in Howard County, um, being in that top five in the state of Iowa, we're actually in the top ten in the nation, and uh, I've been working on this for 22 years and never even thought of such a thing. So, um, so we're, we're definitely working that program to, to the benefit of our farmers.
well, I might as well say my other favorite practice is grass water with. Um, we, uh, in uh, 2022, um, we did 36.3 acres. In 2020, the year of COVID, when, you know, we weren't in the office as much, so we were out in the field a lot. So guess what? We flagged a lot of waterways and promoted that a lot. We, can, we did 110 farms with waterways that year, and that added to over 30 miles of waterways we constructed in one year. And like Hunter said, we, we get it right in there and roll up our sleeves. Um, this is something else that I've really enjoyed um, to see the difference. If you've got a gully running across a field, that's 45 tons of soil erosion per acre. And by putting that grass waterway in, you reduce that from 45 tons per acre to one ton per acre. That's way below uh, T loss. And uh, so it's probably one of the most beneficial as far as soil erosion <clears throat> and water quality that we have in our toolbox. And obviously this year we've got, um, right now we're working on just shy of 30 projects. So uh, we're, we're not gonna run out. I thought we'd run out of doing waterways and you're never gonna run out, so. Well, what's nice about this program <laughs> too is a lot of times when you're, when you're constructing a grass waterway, there's a, a foot gully or larger sometimes and those farmers aren't able to plant into them and cross those waterways. And so it's really disconnecting their fields, making it harder for them to operate. And so being able to install these shallow them up a little bit, take care of that gully. It's really reconnecting their whole farm back together and makes their farming operation work a whole lot smoother come planting and combine time. Uh, cover crops, we kind of hit on it before. Um, I know Neil talked about his uh, Silver Creek project and um, I've never heard of a watershed project or an area ever having more than 50% or even sometimes up to 30% um, coverage of, of cover crops and row crop acres. And so um, that's that's on a whole nother level that I don't know anyone that'll that'll get there for quite some time. So he's done a great job getting those farmers interested. And honestly, it's it's kind of the norm up in that watershed and starting to transition to the other areas of the county now where um, if, if you're not the one with green on your farm, you're kind of the outlier at this point. And this last fall, we ran into some issues trying to get timely rains. And so um, we didn't get as good of a catch as we had in, in past years. Um, but nonetheless, this last week, you're really starting to see that green pop. Um, and so these next uh, three, four days, uh, you're going to start to see a lot more of it pop and you're going to see a lot of really good growth um, that's going to be able to take those early spring rains, which is really where we're aiming for. Um, and so uh, countywide, we had a little over 40,000 acres uh, seeded down, um, which as if you calculate it out to the whole county, um, is about 16 and a half percent of the county's row crop acres. And so uh, that's, that's pretty good, I think. Um, in the Turkey River uh, watershed myself, uh, we seeded about 17,000 acres this year, which was just uh, short of 25% um, of the watershed acres or the row crop acres, I should say. And so um, what's really important with these cover crop contracts is um, we try to use CSP and EQIP as much as possible, which are those federal programs. They're multi-year contracts, anywhere from three to five-year contracts. We compare them with no-till to continue out to five years. And so it's really committing those folks to multiple years. It's not a one-year deal where they have to plan for it. They're not sure if they're going to have funding for it in years to come. They're able to now plan for three to five years out lock seed prices in, get what they need to, able to plan their operations a lot better. And it's worked out really, really well for us. And these federal programs are, are paying really good incentive rates and making it a fairly lucrative deal for these farmers, so. Well, what we're doing is changing the culture of conservation in Howard County. We're, 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 uh, we're giving these people enough years to work with it to, it, to now it's becoming an accepted practice. And you're not going to, you know, if you just do it one year at a time, well, there's two problems with doing it one year at a time. If you just do a one year contract, that means every year you got to go back to all these people and get them signed up. And that's a lot of work. So that's why we like these extended contracts. The other thing is maybe one year like this last year, we didn't have as much moisture in the fall. People may think, well, we didn't really have as much uh, luck with it. Um, but, oh, there's so many things I want to say. I, I could honestly be on here for three hours. <laughs> but one of the things with cover crops is that insurance policy, we're not going to have that fall tillage. They're out there. We're flying this stuff on. We're, we're drilling it on. So right there, we've, we've accomplished something by reducing that fall tillage to, to zilch. Um, now we've got that cover growing. Um, but, and then by, by having these multi-year contracts, we can get you know five 600 acres signed up with Equip. 
now we can go work with the next next group of people to try to get them on board. And now we've got people that come to us and say, hey, my neighbor's doing cover crops. What, what do you have for me? So what we've been doing is um, Equip and CSP is a tremendous amount of money for it, but we still have a waiting list. So then we go to our state programs. We put them on the one year at a time waiting to get on, get funded by Equip. And um, what happened, so we've got people waiting in line to get on, to get co uh, cover crop um, incentives. <clears throat> so what happened this fall, I had um, about 3,000 acres of people in my watershed that um, actually had a few more acres than that were waiting for funding. So I went to um, my Iowa DNR section 319 people and I said, hey, <clears throat> I've got some, I've got $75,000 set in here in my ag waste uh, funding. I don't have a project lined up for them, but I've got 3,000 acres of, of, of cover crop that could be planted this fall if I had funding. And I didn't go with an exorbitant rate. I went with $25 an acre, same as what the state rate would be for a one-year contract, but we did unlimited con uh, acres. I had one contract for 11 acres. I had one contract for uh, about 600 acres. That was the largest one. Most of them were in that 50 to 150 acres. So we got those approval from um, my, my agency people in Des Moines. We got the money switched over and Hunter and I went and hit the field and we got those 3000 acres signed up in about three days. This was like in September, we needed to have this stuff flown. We had the planes were flying and <clears throat> yeah, I mean, it was amazing how quickly we got this done. So, um, you know, we're, we're, we're still got, I, I think we've got more, we've got more people to work with. We're gonna, we're, we're working on a couple of equip programs right now. And uh, I, I think now, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, 55 and a half percent is pretty high, but I'm hoping maybe we can get to that 60% this coming year. Yeah, I can only say this might be one of the only instances I can one up Neil, but uh, when my watershed project got started three years ago as in a planning grant phase, and we took it on as if it was an implementation project. So we were putting practices out there. We were trying to leverage other pro programs. Um, being I had no actual practice dollars through the pro program. Um, and then that following year, we had a very large backlog of cover crop applicants. And um, I went and talked to my state people and said, hey, I need some money here. These folks can't get by with just 160 acre max. What can we do? He goes, well, I got $100,000 here for you. Um, use whatever you can. And if you need more, um, just let me know. I said, well, that's definitely not going to be enough. I said, but we'll spend that hundred grand first and then we'll go um, and look for some more money. And I think in two days I had that hundred grand already obligated and, and already um, approved for the next uh, seating window. And then we went and got another $25,000 um, within the next couple of weeks. So we got $125,000 worth of uh, cover crops at the 25 bucks an acre um, in about a two and a half week window. So I can actually one time say one up, Neil Schaefer. Can you tell we've got a friendly rivalry? I mean, what what a great competition to see who can put more conservation on the ground. That, that's amazing. Chris Henning Chris, has her hand up. She may want to read a couple of questions because there's a few popping in the chat box that may be relevant to this current topic. Well, your whole topic this evening. Okay, so... Um, I think that you've probably answered in uh, indirectly most of these questions, but um, everybody's interested in uh, how you coordinate the practices with your NRCS office, and um, how do you sell the opportunities to farmland owners? And I hear you saying uh, you're not having any problem at all getting farmland people to uh, to um, to do these practices. Um, the, the business about planting, uh, cover crops in, in a rainy autumn and, um, the alternatives. And I think the bottom line of this is more, it sounds like you're getting the funding. So, uh, do you believe that farmers would continue long-term without your support? Um, because it looks to me like you are doing multi-species, multi-year contracts. So they're already doing um, multi-year. They're signing up for multi-year. Um, and okay, 
And I'll answer that this, one. Yeah, that yeah. one. So that one about the will they continue to get someone's behavior to change? You have to. They have to do this for multiple years. And this by having those long term contracts and having that funding in place, we're we're guaranteeing these people when they go back to buy their next planter, they're thinking, hey, I need a planter that's going to be able to plant into cover crops. Hey, I need a, a combine head that's going to work well with cover crops. So that they're they're doing it for those number of years so that their their whole um, their their way of farming is changing and to change habits especially farmers. So farmers are the most independent group of people you're ever going to meet. And we, you know, this is not easy. We're not, it's not a blanket one size fits all. We are tailor making this uh, individually. Some people are strip tilling. Some people use the cover crop for um, forage for their animals, uh, bale it, um, different things like that. So it's, uh, it's very tailor made. It's not a one, one, one shot covers it all, but they will, I believe, continue with this practice because it's going to take five to seven years to realize the uh, soil health benefits of the reduced tillage and the um, having that cover crop and having that structure built up in your soil. And by, you know, I, I'm just amazed and it's already happening because we had a lot of people that would do no-till beans into corn stalks, but they weren't quite comfortable enough doing no-till into uh, corn into bean stove. This last couple of years, and we did a land use assessment in Silver Creek this last year, I'm amazed at how many people are already, hardly any people are doing tillage for soybeans anymore. They're, they're almost all doing no-till soybeans into corn stalks, but the number of farmers planting corn no-till into bean stubble that has had cover crop on it is increasing also. So I think we're, we're slowly changing that whole um, concept of how we farm and it takes a while. And by having these incentives in place, you know, the federal government has, and the state government has made uh, the, the water quality initiative and funding for carbon sequestration um, a priority. And those are the programs we have and we're gonna maximize them to the benefit of our farmers here and to get those uh, those behaviors changed to where we're we're going to be using less tillage and we're going to be using that cover crop and using the multiple effect of cover crop, not just the erosion, but the the building of the structure and, and some of that stuff too. And we have actually already had some firsthand experience with folks. Um, <clears throat> what we try to do is we'll run them. A lot of these folks have ran through a state cost share program that first year getting started. Then we transition them into a single species equip contract. Then we get them into a two species uh, equip contract and then eventually into a multi-species, which is three or more CSP contract. And now we've actually ran into some folks who have already gone through this whole phase, now have no more funding programs that'll pick them up and are continuing to do cover crops and no-till. And a lot of them have found that that multi-species mix and they've been able to hone it into their operations specifically to make it work exactly how they want it to. Um, whether yeah. it's the price of the seed, whether it's uh, some of them are non-winter hardy, some are winter hardy, some have more forage benefits. It all kind of depends, but we have had some folks who either A, didn't get picked up and do it anyways, or they have some land that's in the watershed that got picked up and some that isn't, and they do all their acres, or they've gone through this whole process of these multi-year contracts. Um, no longer eligible and are continuing because they see those soil health benefits. And what's really nice too is it's a step by step. So, like I kind of said, those first uh, years with just cereal rye, and then, okay, so now take it up to the next level. We're going to do a multi species and we're going to do um, maybe we're going to fly it on where you had are going to do green corn grain. Maybe we're going to drill it on where you do. Um, so our harvest soybeans. Remember, we're going to use drones. We used drones for the first time this last year, um, and we were spreading radishes and winter camelina. Um, so the 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 types of cover crops and honing it in and just keeping their attention, like I said, it, uh, to change the whole culture of how you're doing it is uh, is kind of a step by step. Couple and obviously promotion, uh, you know, idols. Uh, Department of Agriculture in Iowa will give us these cover crop signs, so we're putting those up around. Um, I, I ran into somebody that's like, I've never seen so many so much oats being planted. What are they going to do with all this hay? And 
Uh, it's like, no, 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 it's cover crops. It's, uh, it's just uh, overwintering. Um, but uh, so that's, it's kind of a nice promotion. The other nice thing about what we're doing with this cover crop and those uh, native grasses um, in my watershed. So I've got 55.5% of the row crop corn and soybeans as being uh, having cover crops applied in the fall. We also have about 16% of our watershed um, now is in buffer strips along the and grass waterways and, and those types of things in CRP. That means over 75% of the watershed has a living root year round. Um, that's the, one of the major, thing, uh, major things about soil health is emulating um, the uh, uh, nature and having that li living root. Um, you know, when we have plant corn and soybeans, we've got a plant typically there from May until September. And then um, every, the rest of the year, it's just dormant. There's nothing going on. And uh, to keep that activity and microbiology going in the soil, to have those living roots. So, um, so that's, that's huge too. That, that was something I was just sitting there one day thinking about that. And here we're, we really have been emulating what's going on in nature on this uh, production agriculture land. So kind of taking a step back from the, the practices we've been uh, installing, uh, we were actually awarded a, a grant this summer um, to install uh, creek signs. And initially, um, when we wrote the grant, um, it was just going to get the signs on for the Turkey River watershed. Um, and somehow, some way, um, our cost estimates to the, the signs actually went down, which you, is kind of unheard of. And so we were able to then expand our area into the Silver Creek watershed and actually the whole countywide. Um, and we're going to actually be able to install 77 signs here um, before July 1. And we've actually got a, a pretty good slug of them already. Um, installed and replaced with some older ones. Um, so you can see the sign on the right side, the Silver Creek sign. Um, that's what we'll be installing on the, on the bridges. And so all the Turkey River, the tributaries, Silver Creek, um, some larger tributaries to the west in the county. Um, and so it's gonna really help these folks understand what water body they live by or what watershed they live in um, and try to connect those folks um, to that land. Because we, we did some uh, community assessments and we asked people what a watershed is. And um, you should read some of the responses. They're, they're quite humorous. But it, what Hunter said, it's, it's connecting those people. If they realize when they're driving over that river, oh, wait a minute, that's Silver Creek or that's the West Branch of the Turkey River. That's all connected. That connects those people, not only to the, the just drive over the road, but the people that live there. And then when they're farming in their fields and they're looking, they're crossing that bridge with their planter and their tractor. It's like, wait a minute, I'm in that Turkey River watershed. You know, they're working on this project. You know, what I'm doing out here is important for the quality of the river. And um, we did a signing project probably about 15 years ago. We got a grant and did a few signs. Um, but uh, with the help of Steve Hopkins with the uh, Iowa DNR Section 319 program and the DOT and and uh, and locally with our county uh, engineer, um, Nick Risman, he was uh, very helpful. We got the signs, they ordered them for us. They're installing them all, they're, they're going up right now. Um, so that, that's another partnership that we added to our, our list, but uh, it's so important to, and, and you know, Hunter's got the bioreactor sign right on Highway 9 on a heavily traveled road. Um, we've got some wetland signs up. Um, so making people aware what we're doing um, whether you're just driving through or you're living there is, is making a huge difference. So one thing we like to do is a lot of water monitoring. And obviously, you can do a lot of good. You can put a lot of great practices in. But unless you're actually getting that documentation and collecting that data, you truly don't know if you're actually making a difference. And so uh, we do water monitoring in our two watersheds. There's a total of 16 different sites. Uh, we do both in-field sampling, as you can see there in the picture of your, on the left, um, as well as send bottle samples um, to Neil, for Neil's project, the State Hygienic Lab. I send bottle samples down to Cole College. Um, and so we're able to then compare what we've done in the field as well as what they um, collect and analyze in the lab. Um, and we also put uh, thermographs in or water temperature monitors um, in all our streams and our tributaries. Um, to try to keep a, a baseline data and know what's going on in those streams. Um, Neil's watershed project, all his tributaries are cold water and we're in the process 
of basically getting that flip switched um, and getting them designated cold water. Um, they have about 10 years worth of data that has proven um, that it's cold water, not only the temperatures, but the vegetation within and obviously the fish within the streams as well. The Turkey River watershed, on the other hand, um, we have a few tributaries like Stone Creek and Cheok Creek and a few smaller tributaries up in the upper reaches um, that could be potentially cold water streams. Um, but the main branch of the Turkey River is obviously a warm water stream um, where we're more focused on the, the, the sediment and the phosphorus and the uh, nitrogen and stuff like that within the stream. Um, but nonetheless, we love doing the water monitoring. Um, it's a big expenditure um, on our half of the district. Our district pays for it all. Um, we're able to go talk to other farmer groups. Um, our Howard County Experimental Farm has been gracious enough um, to give us donations every year that has covered the cost of all our materials and our needs for water sampling, as well as our um, thermographs that we went and purchased ourselves. And so without them, this would not be possible. We would continue on, have those multiple years of data and not having any lags in between and be able to consistently keep that data moving. Yeah, for, for whatever reason, uh, funding for a lot of monitoring was cut a few years ago. And uh, so we were like, well, okay, well, funding's cut. We're going to find funding somewhere else. So like Hunter said, we went uh, kind of door to door finding where we could find money. And um, our Howard County Experimental Farm, which is the board there is made up a lot of the farmers who Hunter and I work with. So we were explaining to him, I said, hey, you know, uh, monitoring streams and water sampling is not a bad thing. It's a very good thing because we're going to be able to show all the improvements that the farmers have done on their land is having a positive effect on the water. And if we're not taking, keeping um, these monitoring going and having a steady, um, unbroken uh, track of us, you know, from April through October, we're monitoring every week. We're monitoring uh, sites in Hunter's Turkey River watershed one week, and we're monitoring the sites in my watershed the next week. And uh, so, uh, and we, Hunter does a fantastic job of putting together all that data. And we give a, put it, he puts together a report and we go to their January board meeting and we say, hey, look at the improvements that the farmers have, have been, uh, have done on their land and it's showing it. And they, that is, the, that's so important. And that's how we're going to get continued public support. And that's how we're going to change the image of what farming is in the state. Um, you know, there's, there's parts of the state that are, that have some um, challenges going on. And uh, there's no reason we can't be doing the same thing in all the counties in Iowa. But you got to have that data. And I know some counties, they kind of say, well, I guess we didn't get any money. But we're, not, we're not water monitoring anymore. And to get continued project support, um, funding grants for our projects, you have to have that data. You have to show um, improvements, and we are. Very good improvements, honestly. So we've talked a lot about the practices and what we do, but this is ultimately how we get things done. And Chris, I think you were trying to ask the question as to maybe how you can get farmers to enroll their farmland, their highly productive soils into conservation programs. And this is exactly it. It's the trust, it's the relationships, um, that we've worked with and, and been able to establish with these local landowners um, of all kind of shades. And so we've really been able to work. And um, I mean, it's a it's an open relationship that we have with them all. I mean, it's not a eight to four job or a nine to five job, whatever. I mean, it's it's around the clock. It's on weekends. It's when you're in the grocery store, or sporting event, whatever it may be. Um, you're always never knowing the opportunity may arise that a farmer or a landowner may come up with a question and just be able to ease their mind or be able to um, provide that satisfaction to them and give them that good re uh, response so that they feel comfortable to come in. We've always mentioned when someone does come to the counter, um, it maybe is the third or fourth time they've come to town and thought about coming to the counter. And so it takes a lot of um, trust. It takes a lot of gusto on their part just to come on in the doors. And it's our job to really ease into it and make sure that we can do everything possible for them. Um, I'm sure everyone has heard it that the customer is always right. And so that's kind of the mindset that we try to bring forward and try to enable them and do the best things possible with whatever their goals may be. Well, I, I, exactly. I mean, trust is, it comes right down to that. that. That's how we are successful. We've built these, this trust up between our farmers and what we're doing. Um, they trust us to give them a fair shake on the different programs. When we, we, I mean, I've honestly told farms, I wouldn't sign that contract. I don't think that's a very good deal. 
I think uh, what what you're expected to do and the outcome is 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 not practical. There you've gained trust right there. So they know that we're going to come to them with a good, um, well thought out plans, conservation planning, and that not only is works with the families um, that we work with, but also the contractors. Our contractors steer customers to us. Now I'm I don't want to brag, but there's a lot of counties where the contractors say, do not go near that government office. It's gonna be a headache. It's gonna be, it's just gonna don't go there at all. It's gonna cost you money. No, we've got a trust built up with all of our contractors. We've got a tremendous number. Um, we've got about seven, seven, eight earth work, earth moving contractors who build waterways and, and wetland ponds. We've got probably six or seven people that do native drilling of uh, prairie grasses and things. And they know that when they come to us, we're going to have a timely. Um, we've got people that come in one day asking about a waterway. We're out there the next day walking the land with them. We bring our survey equipment with them. And we've got an application for them to sign. And we say, you're going to get in this next funding round. Um, so that, that's one thing is being timely, building that trust, and building a trust so much so that even the contractors are on our, uh, you know, we couldn't do all, all this on our own. Um, I don't know if you have anything on there as far as like number one in the federal programs, but um, we are like number one in the nation or in Iowa on EQIP and CSP. And we, we can't do this just Hunter and I. I mean, it's the few, it's the other farmers that are doing it. It's the different uh, contractors and um, just the experienced and repeat customers. And obviously you can see the partners and Neil mentioned it, you can't do it with just us. And there's a lot of other folks not in our office that we really rely on heavily. I mean, obviously with their CRP um, and the FSA agency right next door, we're over and back multiple times a day as if they are as well. Um, and there's a lot of things that we have to um, okay with them. They okay with us and a lot of collaboration between us both before we even get that final product. Um, and other ones such as like for Pheasants Forever, I mean, obviously all these are great partners, um, but like Pheasants Forever, we're both on the Pheasants Forever board. We work the local habitat organizations. We're working with our county conservation board, um, the different programs out there, the DNR, fisheries, all those different kinds we're of We're on our, our local bike trails committee. Um, we serve on that committee, the Prairie Trails Committee. Um, so um, there was one question there about uh, how do we get the NRCS to go along with us on this stuff? Um, I guess I'm, uh, I'm very good at, uh, it's kind of like that old story with Tom Sawyer and painting the fence and he tells them how much fun it is to paint that fence and before long they're all out there painting the fence and he's not doing a whole lot of work. Hunter and I are still doing a lot of work, but we, we always make our office atmosphere very uh, lively and positive. Um, we're always looking at how we can do things. We're not always, you know, I've always said we're the buffer between the farmer and the government program. These programs are not easy. They're, they're complicated. They're constantly changing. Um, and it's our job to keep on top of that. But it is, if, you're, if you don't have that mindset of being positive and figuring out how we're going to get this done, you'll throw your hands up and say, oh, that program's too complicated. I'm not even going to suggest it to that farmer. No, we're going to figure out how are we going to make it work? And is there an easier way to do it? We've actually, we've actually had um, impact on programs where they find out how we're doing it and they emulate that for other counties. Now, whether they do that or not, that's up to them. But, um, you know, that, that's how we get the NRCS on board. And we're willing to go out there and do a lot of that legwork. Like Hunter said, he does, helps the farm with all the permitting for the stream bank projects, which are equipped. We help with getting the nutrient management plan people lined up to get their ag waste projects going. Um, so it's it's one of those things. Get in there, roll up your sleeves, and and work. And you will not believe how many people you're going to bring along to help you get that done. So we talk about mentoring opportunities a lot, and I can speak on behalf of this one because I was in those shoes um, when I was in high school. I knew I wanted to do something outdoors. I thought maybe I wanted to be a CEO with the DNR or whatever it may be. And to be honest, I had no clue this even existed. Um, and through Neil, he invited me in to come volunteer and check it out for a, a few days or an hour or whatever it may be. And instantly I, I drew a love to it. I knew this is exactly what I wanted to do. Um, thankfully, I was already going to be going to school for that at college. 
Um, and so starting out, I actually volunteered for two weeks before even being hired on. And just one thing led to another and it all kind of worked out for me. Um, but being able to have someone who shows you the ropes the right way. Um, we were at, I was actually on the wrestling hall of fame board. And last night we had our hall of fame banquet and one of the inductees said, there's, there's two ways you can go. You can take the easy road or you can take the hard road. The easy road leads to nothing. And the hard road is going to lead to something that's going to be successful or something that's going to be astonishing at some point, whether that's a year, five years, 20 years, 50 years, you don't know that. You just need to keep on down that hard road and keep your nose to the grindstone. And that's exactly what we did. I mean, we don't take the easy road. We definitely take the hard road. We're the ones out there. We're the ones doing the hard work. We're trying to do it the right way. And eventually you find some sort of success or some sort of gratitude. And so I can speak on behalf of that firsthand. I was able to have some sort of an opportunity and take as much um, positive at impact from that and make the most of it. And now being able to turn it around and, and give back and mentor other folks um, is exactly what we're trying to do. Because you always got to have someone that's going to reload or someone that's going to take your spot eventually. And so being able to train people the right way is extremely important and make sure that they know that there is a way. And so that when they do get in these offices that they don't feel overloaded or they don't feel um, all that stress, whatever it may be, um, going in as a new employee. Dave, it looks like you got a question there. Hope you're muted, Dave. You're still muted. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, you guys, wonderful to have you. Um, my question is, in your whole farm planning, do your producer clients measure uh, outcome, excuse me, input reduction outcomes, uh, you know, diesel fuel, fertilizer applications, uh, inorganic nitrogen, on and on. Uh, is, is that economic assessment part of the ball game? Um, we don't go into that as much as other than in generality, just saying, you know, if you're, you're just doing one pass across a field where you used to do three, obviously you're going to have uh, conservation and energy use. Um, so in a roundabout way, we do. It, it would be nice to have a tool where we plug in all this stuff and we're going to say, this is how much uh, energy you've saved. We do have a tool that shows how much on uh, nutrients you've reduced from reaching a stream and how much sediment you've reduced reaching the stream. Um, we have a pollution calculator that we do that for every practice that Hunter and I do in our watersheds. Um, honestly, I wish NRCS would do that with all their federal programs too. Hunter and I do it if we use federal programs in our watersheds, but um, it's, it's, we can actually put a value on how much uh, soil, how much uh, water improvements they're doing with that. Um, and then as far as like return on investment, um, we did, we can run those ideas about how much it costs to put corn and soybeans and fertilizer on an acre. And if you're only getting 60 bushel return compared to that by seeding it down to native grasses and giving $300 an acre guaranteed return each year. Um, mm -hmm. so in those, in those piecemeal things we can do, um, it would be kind of nice to have a, but I think we'd have to have hire five more staff members to keep up with all that, <laughs> with just the number of people we're working with. Well, the, some of those ideas, I think, um, and I'll let somebody else in, but, you know, it should, we need to get those into the conservation features in that next farm bill. And, um, you know, hiring the two of you now two or three times with us and the rich work you're doing it is so vital that those messages come beyond those of us on this thinking like a watershed meeting, but where decisions are made about the great return on resources because of what you're doing and try to improve the features of our, of our farm bill. So I'll stop. Thank you. Thanks, David. Um, there are, oh, and you still have more and I want to see it. So there it was a good question, couple of good questions about are you NRCS employees, contractors, 
staff or how that works. We all want you in our counties <laughs> and uh, we need to know how to do that. Um, and then Cornelia had the best line of the whole thing. What wonderful work you are doing and just an understated, wow. <laughs> okay, so- so, four, um, so 22 years ago when I started, there were four employees in our office. We're up to about 11 now. Six of those have been district employees. If you're, and that's what Hunter and I are, we're district employees. We have to, we are what we consider full-time temporary employees. I've been a full-time temporary employee for 22 years, which means we have to go out and get grants, um, write grant proposals to fund our position in the first place so that we can help farmers do this, which I think is just the most upside down way of doing things when we've got so much work to do um, we have to still take time to just make sure that we're here. Um, but I've also been told if you're doing a good job, the money will come. So we haven't had a uh, problem getting money. Um, but all those other district employees, those are all grant based. Uh, we've got probably four different ways we get district employees hired. We just hired a, a fine young guy. He's going to be a technician uh, working for designs and stuff on bioreactors and saturated buffers, uh, Riley Wilson. That is because of Hunter's Watershed Project. They wrote in the Hunter's Watershed Project funding for a technician. I mean, so now we're not, so not, you know, we don't have enough employees to help with all the design. Now even we're using our projects to get technicians to help us design stuff. Um, we've got a summer intern every year, idle student. Um, Hunter was a district technician right from the get go. But all of those monies, we have to we go around, we go to the county supervisors, we ask for funds. They've been fantastic about giving us about $17,000 a year we put towards that kitty. Um, we've gone to the national um, NC, NC, NACD. Um, we have a full-time employee who does work on C EQUIP and CSP. Um, but uh, so yeah, so Hunter and I are district employees. There's soil and water district employees. We have a one uh, IDLE's employee, who's our, our, our conservation assistant, and then our federal employees are, the NRCS actual employees are, we have a soil con, a fed technician, and our DC. Thank you. Awesome. That helps and, uh, with that. <clears throat> we'll, we'll provide light at the end of the tunnel. We just got about three or four slides here left, and then we can really hammer out these questions. Um, <clears throat> but uh, I think this is probably one of the more important slides. It's community engagement. Um, if, if anyone knows Neil and I here in the community, that's really where we find our roots at. We're trying to be on as many boards as possible, but yet being productive on those boards, um, trying to be in, involved with as much as we can. Uh, myself on the, the fire department, Iowa Wrestling Hall of Fame, our youth wrestling, um, I coach high school wrestling, um, also helping out with the little kids and stuff like that. So our Pheasants Forever. Um, so just trying to do as much as you can that acclimates or in, endorses yourself with the work you're doing here at the office as well. But it's um, also so important to um, engage those people who are the policy makers. Um, we've had Iowa Secretary Nag up here on a tour. He's going to be um, in Cresco uh, giving a presentation uh, next month. We're going to be going to that. We, every year we have our state legislators. We take them on a tour around the watersheds. Um, we had Senator Grassley up here a while back. So, and Hunter and I have had the opportunity, I've had the opportunity to go to Washington, D.C. nine times um, and visit the White House. I visited USDA, I visited the Capitol, um, explain what we're trying to do here. Hunter's been with me on two of those trips. Um, and uh, so it's kind of like the song, A Little Light of Mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Um, we're doing our best to bring as much light to what we're doing here. Um, but we also have to get all our work done here too. So, um, so it, it's it's uh, it's pretty hectic. Where our evenings are sometimes as busy as our daytimes um, with all the community groups we're involved with, and and trying to just keep up with all the different uh, um, people who want to hear from us. And we're we're trying to share. And this is a, a, a great opportunity for us to share with even a bigger crowd. And so we've talked about a lot of different programs, and this is actually a pie chart um, of Neil's Watershed Project, just showing the different funding sources. It's the alphabet soup. You can see all the different acronyms and the different places these monies are coming from. And that's ultimately what helps make a successful watershed project. And that was one of the first things 
that I learned as a watershed coordinator is utilizing as many different pots of funds that you can, not using your own funding source. So like with Neil's project being 319, you can see there that he's only using 13% of 319 funds. He's using CSP, the CRP, WERB, EQIP, WSPF, whole alphabet soup to help fund that program or fund that project and utilize as much money as possible. You know, leveraging for maximum impact. I don't know where I get these ideas for some of these PowerPoint pages, but um, it truly is. Um, it's we're getting as many people involved. We're involving NRCS. We're involving idols. We're involving the district. We're involving the landowners um, to all contribute. And that helps. And I've told our state legislators many times because our, obviously our funding comes from the state for Hunter Mine. Um, I say, give me a dollar of state money and I will turn it into $10 of conservation. Between the landowners and federal programs that we can leverage this with, um, we can get so much more done. But you have to have those project coordinators and those district employees and in those offices who are not just, you can, an application laying on a counter does nothing. It sits there. You have to have someone put it into their hands. And it's not just at the counter. Hunter and I will take a stack of applications in our truck and we will go door to door. And crazy as it seems, October 1st is the deadline for our federal program. Well, what are farmers doing in Iowa on October 1st? They're in their field. So we're out, you know, we see that farmer and we know we want to talk to them about cover crops. We, we run out there, get them off the combine there, wait till they get to the end of the field and let their grain out. They say, oh, there's the government truck. There's Neil and Hunter. They hop out and I said, what do you got for me today? I said, all I got today for you is to sign an application. We're going to talk about cover crops in January. Uh, I don't want to take much time of your day, but you know, we got to get this. If we don't have an application. We aren't going to have funding. You have to have an application and you have to meet these deadlines. And that's just the way it is. And like I said, you have to have those people willing to put that application in front of the farmer and explain these are the different programs. You know, their eyes are glazing over if we just lay a, 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 a spread of uh, different program applications out there. And uh, so that's our job. I mean, we're project coordinators. We're coordinating with farmers, with the, the uh, contractors, the, the, the whole, everybody. We're coordinating it. That's a perfect name for what we do. Whoever came, I can't coin that phrase. That, that came before me, but project coordinator. That mm -hmm. is what we do. And that's how we're successful. And this is our troop. Um, you can't think, of, there's no, I will put this, this group of people up against any county in the nation as far as willingness to have empathy for their farmers, a desire and a passion for the environment, for the, what, the quality of living in their community, their water, soil, um, soil health. Um, um, you know, I've, I've recruited a lot of people to come on board and, you know, we're looking for those positive people with a, a desire and a passion for what we're doing. And uh, like I said, at the beginning of the program, my, my, my job is to ignite that passion and that uh, spark. And uh, sometimes it's, some days it, it's pretty tough. You got a lot of stuff going on. You have, might have some personal things going on. Um, Kurt Haft was uh, one of my DCs uh, a few years ago. He said, when you come through that door, Make sure that nobody knows that you've got a bad day because that does nothing but bring everybody down. You're coming in here. We're going to get work done. Um, and that powerful synergy that we've created in this office, and that's how we get NRCS to, to come help. Like Hunter said, we're willing to jump in there, but keeping that positive attitude and, and enjoyment. And honestly, this year is going to be a great summer. We're going to have our biannual um, awards luncheon. We're going to hand out probably what a dozen 15 awards to different families throughout the county talk about a rewarding day um, of having these people who you've helped help their land come to receive an award <clears throat> for doing the right thing i mean yeah it's it's uh it's a wonderful wonderful career i've told my interns and and people i've mentored you love what you do you'll never work a day in your life and I, I wonder what the working and what, what work would be because I have I haven't found a day of work yet here. So these are uh, soil and water commitments. <clears throat> these are basically what we would say are our bosses. 
um, but they are by no means very bossy. Um, they do anything that we need um, to improve what we're trying to do. Um, they're all ears, they're all help. They're here to do whatever we can to move that ball down the field, just like that whole field staff is. Um, they're nothing but open arms and open ears. Um, we had a commission meeting today and uh, one of them is actually a, a conservation agronomist at our local co-op. And so to get him out of the field and get him in the office for half hour, 45 minutes, obviously shows how important this is to them. And lastly, uh, obviously our podcast, we, let, we put the link in there. Um, like we said at the beginning, this was something that we wanted to put out there for an informational piece. It's no, by no means something we wanted to get a lot of clicks. We weren't trying to go famous. We weren't trying to get any sort of monetary amount or anything like that. It was all just to be informational and get that information out there. Um, as folks are sitting in the combine, as they're in the planter, taking long road trips, whatever it has been. Um, it's been an absolute blast. We've definitely had some ups and downs with it as far as the technology. We actually tried recording here an episode last week and thought we had it all fine and dandy and actually got zero audio. And so if you know what a podcast is, that's kind of important. Um, but nonetheless, you just keep moving forward and make the best of it. And it's crazy. We've uh, actually have listens from over eight, from eight countries. Um, actually, it, it was 24 states. And since then, it's grown. We've actually been in 32 different states now um, and a little over 1,200 listeners um, between Spotify and Apple Music. Um, and so that's pretty cool that we're getting that many views, that many listens. And we only hope to increase that and get that word out about the programs, about how we can do um, the practices, how we can get the, that outreach and stuff like that. And so um, it's been nothing but absolute blast to try to do. It's just like coming to work every day or coming to fun every day. You can't even call it work. Um, and so it's, it's been an absolute, uh, joy to, to go well, on and do this. I, I don't know. I'm not very techie. So I had heard a podcast, but when we sat down to do the first one, we thought, well, how long should it be? How long? And we thought, well, I don't know, 20 minutes or 30 minutes. And all of a sudden it was an hour and I was like, oh, well, that's good. Well, now that's kind of our norm as we do an hour. So, and we, we kind of focus them on a different topic each time, but it is a lot of fun. And uh, it's kind of neat because I'm I'm scrolling through YouTube uh, pops up and here Hunter and I pop up in there. So I got to take an hour out and listen to what we said. And um, so it's a lot of fun. And uh, it is a it's a learning tool. What we what we told our agency people is uh, and they they love them, too. And and what what's nice is if we have some new um, uh, project queries around the state, you know, we've been doing this for a few years. So um, we've can't say that we've always done everything right. We've made mistakes and we talk about those too. And uh, so this is just a learning tool for everyone. So we'll close with that. Um, appreciate you guys taking the time and listen to us, obviously. Um, we went a little longer than we were hoping to, but when you only have 25 slides, you, you think it won't take that long, but then you start getting on different tangents and whatnot and you get pretty excited about what we've been doing. So um, appreciate you guys having us on here and hopefully we can... Uh, answer a few questions for you before we get signed off. Yeah, that, I'll just um, echo everybody's comments about all your great works. Um, as you know, we're um, big fans of yours and have been for the last couple of years. I just wanted to bring up um, something about like, you guys are just doing this great effort with all volunteers. Um, I mean, it's a voluntary program. Do you really think that this can be duplicated throughout the whole state where, or, or do you think that some kind of uh, speed signs might have to be put up in order for others to come on board? I mean, you know, everybody's saying that it's only going to work. We're not going to have any regulations and this is only going to work if, if and, and it's working. Well, it's definitely working in Howard County, but it doesn't seem to be working very many other places in our state so do you what it, what are your thoughts do you think that well what yeah. honestly it comes down to people um you need to hire the right people um you have to find i've always said give me someone that's got ambition work ethic and a desire to learn and i'll show them my programs i'm not all keen about just because you got a degree and in a biology or a degree in conservation or a degree, you know, Hunter's got a fantastic degree in conservation, but he was working here the entire time he was going to college. So it made his experience so much greater. 
But give me those people that have those experiences, whether they're in banking or uh, marketing or whatever, that enthusiasm and positive out, uh, positive people with energy. That's that's how you drive this stuff. Um, that's how we're that's how we we make things happen. So unfortunately, it's it's going to take people, and you need to pe get those people out there. We need more watershed projects in the state. Um, that that's key. Howard County has been famous in the state for having watershed projects. We started in the '90s with the Bioc Trout Stream project. Um, Frank Moore was one of our first uh, environmental specialists. I I kind of took after him. He, so we've all, well, I've been here. He was there before me and then me. So that's been us. And then Hunter's been on board for going on nine years now. Consistency, that's another key. Finding people with those local contacts to work in the office. Um, you know, I, I, I recruit as many local people as I possibly can. Um, Riley that we just recruited, <clears throat> he grew up in Cresco, went to college at UNI, ended up in Des Moines for a couple of years. We recruited him. He came back to his community. He loves it here. He's happy to be back here. Um, you know, so right there, that's one of the things. So recruitment, retention is important. Um, I tell you what, environmental specialists, project coordinators, we have the largest turnover. You would not believe how many fantastic young people like Hunter that I've met in my 22 years who couldn't hack it. I mean, it's stressful not knowing if you're going to have health insurance or if you're going to get a, con uh, <clears throat> a project awarded or a grant funded for your position. And a lot of people leave. And that's that's sad, so sad. That's uh, we lose them to a lot about. of agencies. Yeah. That's exactly what we talked about at the Farm Bill Summit <coughs> that I was sharing with you earlier is, mm -hmm. is you know, people don't want to work for twenty five thousand dollars a year. And they 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 get them started. They have a good person, and then boom, they're gone within six months. Mm -hmm. Yep. So. Um, we have our our comp chat thing. I'm going to answer some questions really quick. <clears throat> yes, we are housed in the NRCS office here in Cresco, um, the USDA building, which I think is important. Um, we have access to all the farm programs. We have access to all the databases of the farmers, um, all their land that they operate. Um, I mean, it, it would be very difficult not to be in a USDA building and do what we do. Um, the podcast, um, Christine, if we could get a recipient list on an email chain of some sort, um, we can send both our presentation PDF um, along with a couple other nice attachments that we weren't able to put in as well as a link to our podcast as well. Who writes our paychecks? The Swan Water District. So that money for mine uh, originally comes from the EPA, goes to the Iowa DNR, Iowa uh, Section 319 Water Bureau, goes to IDLES, then comes to the district. Um, Hunters comes from IDLES, the Water Quality Initiative, comes to the district, and then the district writes our checks. Um, the soil testing, um, this is actually our CSP program in a nutshell. That's what's so important about that CSP program is the Haney test is incorporated to pretty much every single CSP contract that we have. And so doing those baseline soil tests and then continuing them every year as they're improving mm -hmm. and doing these conservation practices. Um, extra funding for water samples. Um, for hunters water samples, we uh, go to the, soil, uh, to the Howard County Experimental Farm give us a grant so that we can get those done. Um, in my watershed, I have a water bureau or I have a water monitoring plan. So if we add a site, um, it's gotta be approved a year ahead in advance. So, um, so we have some restrictions there. Um, the application of cover crops, we kind of hit on it real quick. We do not provide the seeding applications. That's all contractors. So whether a farmer is gonna drill it himself, he's gonna contract someone to drill it on, they can contact um, an airport or a uh, company that flies it on. There's also a couple folks on our, that are doing drones, but it's just like any of our other conservation practices. They are privately contacting contractors. We have a master list that we can provide to them, but we do not directly line that up for them. Um, one really neat thing is this last year, uh, they made some improvements out at our local airport, which is right outside our office. We can hear 
all the cover crop planes taken off right from our office in the right when we're in the midst of writing applications for new people for the next year. But they did some improvements out there with concrete and all um, so that they can be loading three planes at a time and fueling a plane. And those planes are just rotating out. Um, we've got a couple different uh, companies that come in and they spend <clears throat> a week or two at a time and they camp out, they bring their campers and they just stay because we got so much business. And we were visiting with them this last year and they're like, what are you guys doing up here? Everybody talks about Howard County. They got to go up there with all their equipment and all their planes and stuff. And, uh, you know, and it's not just the Crestco Airport. We've got in the southern part of the county, they fly out in New Hampton. They're flying out of Osage. Um, so we're, we're covering it uh, all around the county. The drone thing, that's a new thing that's kind of coming on board. Um, we got a couple guys that are, are doing the drones. With that, we're using the winter camelina and radish. Someone asked about our favorite cocktail of, of cover crop. Um, honestly, cereal rye with some radish and turnips in there, I think is, is pretty adequate. You're covering uh, some different resource concerns with that. So. <coughs> So that was our rapid fire with the, the chat question. So um, open it up if you have any other questions. I think you got most of those in, in uh, and very quickly. Um, Christine, where are we on time? And do I we have any last, any last burning issues? You're going to send out um, the um, hunters and um, Neil's info, right? Oh Tomorrow. yeah, I always include that um, along with the YouTube link. And um, I, if all goes as planned, I'll try to get that completed by before, maybe tomorrow a bit before the end of the week. I usually have it within a few days <clears throat> that I send it oh. out to everybody oh. that's registered. And I also will include the previous links, which are to the podcast. And I will make their emails available. and. If it's okay with everybody that registered, which I think it is, I will give you um, those emails so that you guys can put the people would probably be interested in being on your podcast list. And we do love going, taking our road on the show. So if there's any events coming up or conferences where, um, you know, you guys are a wide group of people that have a lot of different contacts, um, we're more than happy to uh to accommodate uh, giving a presentation at an event also. Well, I, I'm, I'm certain that you're probably going to be receiving a few more awards. I know that <laughs> the Isaac Walton League is always like, has you top on our radar. <laughs> I don't know if we're allowed to give it to the same people a couple of years in a row. <laughs> well, being you brought up awards, last year Hunter was awarded the Outstanding Watershed Coordinator of the Year. And uh, I, he, he got to that level of achievement a lot faster than I did because I think it was a, two years prior to that, I received that award. So uh, he's uh, coming up in my rearview mirror pretty quickly here. So um, I think I did a good job of uh, mentoring. You did. You, you guys are rock stars. And we're really thrilled to have you be a part of the state and to do what you're doing. Like we said, if we could just clone you guys, um, you know, like they're cloning some of these animals, <laughs> let's clone <laughs> them and have them. In every <clears throat> well, send those clones my way because I've got a stack of stuff on my desk that I would love to delegate to a couple of me and Hunter too. Yeah. So we can, I, be, in, so we can be in the field more and talk more with farmers and get more of this conservation on the ground. That's great. Well, um, I think we're done. It looks, yep, everybody says uh, they're duplicating your uh, great works and all that. So have a beautiful evening and thanks. Thank you everybody for taking time to be with us this evening and in um, gratitude to both of you again. And we'll, we'll be, we'll keep in touch. Thanks so much. And thank you, Chris, for co-hosting as you. No problem. No problem. It was okay. a great presentation. Yeah, thank you. Thank Thanks. you.